Like I said, welcome everyone and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us um, on a fresh Tuesday morning. Uh, this is the next one in a series of webinars that we've been hosting throughout the year, and we really wanted to tackle carbon labels for everyone. We know it's kind of a hot topic right now, and so we're also going to be talking about how food businesses can get started using them. So, you know, some of you might know already, but my name is Rose. I look after all things content and community here at Food Steps, and I've worked in sustainability for about five years now, so I'm all too familiar with the craft of the gentle craft, I must say, of communicating your sustainable claims. And also we'll be joined by Sophie Stevens, our impact manager. She'll introduce herself in just a moment. And just a recap of like what we'll be talking about today. So we'll be doing a quick uh, rundown of, you know, the Green Claims Code and some other regulation that you might want to be aware of. And we'll also be talking about some examples from our own clients and um, also some examples of other carbon label uh, usage cases. Uh, we'll be running for about 40 minutes and then we'll have about 15 minutes of a Q&A. Uh, and don't forget that you can also ask questions throughout the session with a QA and a uh, box at the bottom. So before we jump in, I'd like to properly introduce ourselves. So we are Food Steps and we are a mission-driven business. For those of you who don't know, we envisage a world where food is a solution to the climate crisis. And as some of you might be aware, food creates around 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we are dedicated to help food companies measure, reduce, and communicate their environmental food, print, uh, food footprint, I must say. So I think let's, pun intended, let's jump into the meat and potatoes of why we're all here. Let's talk about carbon labels. So uh, I think it'd be really good to start the session off with a bit of a reminder of the differentiation between environmental labels and carbon labels. So we know that not every single brand is number one gonna want to use environmental labels or carbon labels in the first place, but we do hope that today's session is a good, um, I guess a springboard for you to start getting uh, acquainted, familiar and inspired. Uh, if you do so wish to use these tools in the future. Um, but let's start off with what is an environmental label and what is a carbon label? What does that actually mean? So what can be included under the umbrella term of an environmental label? So right now it's worth noting that there is no regulation and there is no legislation in the UK specifically that enforces a universal set of measuring and communicating things that might fit under ESG, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, some company, uh, some companies, some countries do actually have regulation, but Sophie's going to be taking you through that in just a moment. Um, but here are some examples of environmental labels or ESG labels that you might already be quite familiar with. I think we were all very familiar with organic biodiversity, human welfare, water usage, um, and all of these can be classed as environmental labels. But for today in particular, we are talking about just carbon. So what exactly can an environmental label look like and what can a carbon label look like? So this is a lot of examples. Um, so you can see there's uh, all different kinds of labels as you can see in the center just here, uh, some ones that you're probably very familiar with. So we've got Fairtrade, The Leaping Bunny, The Rainforest Alliance as well. Uh, you can also see this example here from Rapa Nui. I hope I'm always saying that brand uh, name correctly, Rapa Nui. Uh, they've incorporated uh, environmental labeling within their um, clothing tags. And they've also used iconography, which is very similar to things that we might be, um, we might have seen on things like dishwashers and other electronics or energy usage labels. Uh, here we have some examples from our friends over at Foundation Earth. Uh, they've developed a robust data-driven environmental scoring for food products, so specifically having their environmental labels front of pack. So they've used a similar, similar to us and similar to others in the space. They've used a very classic uh, traffic light system that we're all very familiar with when it comes to nutrition, for example. Um, but labels can be put on packaging, it can be put on labels, it can be put on all different kinds of marketing materials, but we'll get to that in just a second. But we've also included some examples here of our own carbon labels, uh, but we will be talking to you about those in literally just on the next slide. So um, these are our labels. Uh, if you are a customer of ours, you might be already quite familiar with these. Um, but if you have never seen our labels before, here you are. 
Uh, we recently did a bit of an update and we've updated these in collaboration with um, a gentleman called Paul Loham uh, out of the University of Cambridge. He's a behavioural change expert um, and we've changed these labels and updated them for a plethora of different reasons. But the key ones that we wanted to identify is that everyone's customers or you as a food business, your customers are going to be interacting with your labels in lots of different scenarios. So uh, there is no one label that should rule them all. Every single label should be more suitable for the touch point that you're using them on. Uh, so we've designed a whole range, as you can see here, from highly, um, highly um, busy, I guess you could say, with all the information that you might be needing to super, super simplified that you might want to use, uh, let's say maybe on packaging or on your menus. Uh, but another cool thing here, as you can see with this example on the left-hand side, is um, we wanted to give all our customers an opportunity to uh, not overload their customers with uh, too much information. So we've offered them a chance to have a label that doesn't have the carbon footprint number. It, the idea is that this will help um, customers or your customers feel less intimidated and a bit more focused on what they really want, which is, is this going to be better for the planet? Um, so that is a brief introduction to environmental and carbon labels and R labels. And I'm going to pass off to Sophie now, who's going to talk to you about why you could think about carbon labeling in the first place. Um, thank you very much, Rose. Uh, hi, I'm Sophie. I'm the impact manager at Food Steps. Um, as the title might suggest, it means I'm mainly focused on understanding how businesses can make the most impact with their food and ultimately reduce emissions in line with net zero goals. And naturally, carbon labelling feeds quite nicely into this. So we're continuing to trial our new labels and figure out alongside our clients how they can be used most effectively as a tool for reduction, communication, the full works, basically. Um, so at the moment, as you might be aware, there are no regulations in the UK to say that you have to put carbon labels on your products and menus. So naturally, you might be questioning why you'd opt to do it voluntarily. There's obviously lots of reasons why businesses, like many of you online today, are keen to start putting carbon labels across your food and drink offering. So let's get into it. First of all, thinking about the knowledge gap. Uh, so there's a really significant gap in knowledge when it comes to the carbon footprint of food. Consumers, as well as food providers, like many of you here today, tend to be quite disconnected from the impacts that their food have on the environment all the way through its lifespan from farm to fork. Uh, as well as a disparity across different food types. So really how much worse for the environment is your beef steak compared to a grilled portobello mushroom, for example. Uh, and this is through no fault of your own. Access to this type of information is hard to come by, which is something that we might know better than anyone. Uh, carbon footprint labeling intends to bridge this knowledge gap by providing people with that missing piece of information about the impact of their food on the environment. And as a result, that might lead them to make different choices about what they're going to eat for lunch, for example, in favor of lowering their environmental impact. So unsurprisingly, this is only made more effective by aligning other determinants of choice with environmental outcomes. Thinking about price, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that lots of research has proven that making the lowest carbon option the cheapest is a super effective way of influencing decision making. And more generally, labeling will only become more effective as consumer understanding of the food problem grows and they become more, more familiar with the standard set of labels. And also as our insight into food impacts continues to improve. Next, thinking about brand reputation. So transparency is a really key word here that might come up a bit over the course of this webinar. Consumers want it um, and are ultimately looking to find out that they can trust the information that you're putting out there. So basically that you're not guilty of greenwashing. Much like nutritional specs, consumers view businesses as having a responsibility to provide them with accurate information about the sustainability of their offering. And by backing up your claims with data, which you might choose to display on carbon labels in the form of an impact score, for example, you can continue building consumer trust in your brand, as well as carbon labeling more widely. Labeling ultimately enables you to signal yourself as a business that cares not only about the environmental impact of your products, but also about sharing this openly with your consumers. So how does this all fit into your net zero targets? Uh, principally, environmental labeling is intended as a tool for impact reduction by aligning consumer preferences to low impact foods and ultimately helping to keep emissions from sales down. Environmental labels are a really useful way also to internally and externally communicate the impact of your food. 
and make sure that you have full transparency when walking to working towards net zero goals. So changes to impact scores can also then be visible, which will highlight the important work that your business is doing on the journey to net zero that would otherwise be taking place behind the scenes. And this kind of visibility with the end consumer can also help with engaging your suppliers on sustainability by putting additional pressure on your suppliers to reduce their impacts and ultimately the number that is shown on the label. So to hammer this message home, it's not just us that want you to carbon label, your customers are also keen to see sustainability labels on products. Um, so the Carbon Trust ran a survey that showed that two thirds of the consumers across UK and EU support carbon labels being placed on products. So building a bit more on what customers actually think about labels, um, in the redesign of our own carbon labels, we actually performed a survey of a thousand consumers to see what they had to say about them. We very bravely opened up the floor to any feedback, uh, which was definitely an enlightening experience. Um, through this exercise, it was pretty easy to identify some common trends among consumer opinions on environmental labeling. Um, and you'll read some of the quotes here on the screen. Uh, generally speaking, consumers were definitely really concerned about substantiation, both that the labels themselves could be trusted as measures of sustainability instead of just another greenwashing gimmick. Um, and also that calculation methods are accurate and shared with the consumer. This kind of transparency is particularly important given that it was quite clear that um, a lot of consumers uh, still didn't really understand exactly what carbon footprint meant and what it accounted for, um, and that the concept of local food and air miles was still quite dominant amongst their understanding of what sustainable food actually looks like. Um, so yeah, I think education is definitely going to be another very integral piece to using environmental labels effectively and definitely one to think about. Uh, some consumers were also concerned about whether this would result in rising costs, which given the current climate would naturally be a really undesirable outcome. And sort of in line with this, we also noticed quite a few comments that highlighted the tension between individuals versus the big corporates. So consumers are rightly very keen not to bear the full burden of saving the climate. Um, and it's important that businesses talk about the work they're actively doing to help push the climate agenda forward and ensure customers don't feel like they're wholly responsible for taking action. So importantly, there's some upcoming as well as existing regulation around environmental labelling. This should provide some comfort to businesses that are looking to eco-label, as it should provide a standardised framework for the methods that underpin the labels um, and just make sure that you're moving in the right and the same direction as everyone else. So we'll get on to the Green Claims Code a bit later, but firstly, wanted to talk about uh, the National Food Strategy that was published in 2021, which was the first independent review of England's entire food system in 75 years. So safe to say, very important, but also long overdue. While there's been some criticism about the government's response to this um, in the food strategy that was released the following year, including from Henry Dimbleby himself, a really positive thing that's come out of this is the Food Data Transparency Partnership. So this partnership aims to improve access to and use of data across food sustainability metrics, as well as other metrics. Um, and within this, environmental impact labeling has been pinpointed as a target. The idea is that creating a simple and consistent way of labeling will ensure that all retailers and manufacturers give the same kind of information about the food that they're selling. Um, and also having to record this information in the first place um, might influence how products are being made in favor of lowering their impact. Um, while the methodology for environmental labeling will be voluntary, it's possible that this could become mandatory in future. So definitely one to watch. It's important also to acknowledge the global context of using eco labels, given that most of you will probably be working in other markets outside of the UK. Um, in March 2023, the EU proposed a new directive for green claims, which will undoubtedly have a pretty big impact on how eco labels are used moving forward. So much of the guidance around making environmental claims more generally reflects that of the UK Green Claims Code. So nothing too different there. Uh, but I guess the difference, the key difference in this proposed directive is that it goes into a lot more detail about how that affects environmental labelling. So some of the concerns that the directive is looking to address include consumer trust, third party verification, and also the sort of spread and variety of environmental labels that Rose showed um, earlier on during this webinar. 
So ultimately, EU member states will be responsible for establishing their own environmental labelling schemes in line with EU law, as well as the penalties for uh, not complying with these schemes. There's obviously quite a lot to unpack here, and we do have a blog on our website that goes into a bit more detail on this, and I think should be included in the follow-up notes to this webinar. Great. So most of you will probably be quite familiar with and may have even read Start to Finish the Green Claims Code, which was released by the Competition and Markets Authority in 2021 to meet consumer demand for policing misleading claims. While the Green Claims Code isn't super explicit about environmental labelling in comparison to the proposed EU directive that we just spoke about, it can still be treated as indicative of how we should be using eco-labels as a form of environmental claim. Uh, the Green Claims Code outlines six key principles that businesses can follow when constructing their own green claims, uh, most of which I imagine are pretty integral to your marketing process already. So first of all, um, green claims should be truthful and accurate. So claims that are more likely to be misleading uh, would be ones where they overstate the positive environmental impact of a product, uh, which might happen if you start using broader or more general terms like green, sustainable or eco-friendly. Unless your product has a genuinely positive impact on the environment, that's unlikely to ever be true or accurate. So using the carbon footprint of your product, such as through a carbon label, is a way of mitigating this as it's more of a factual statement. Uh, secondly, uh, should be clear and unambiguous. So the meaning that a consumer is likely to take from your green messaging should match the product's actual environmental credentials. Um, so yeah, similar to the first principle, if you're looking to carbon label, then the carbon footprint should be accurate to that product. Um, and then thirdly, um, green claims shouldn't omit important information. So that might involve things like cherry picking positive environmental aspects and maybe trying to convince consumers that a product is greener than it actually is, uh, which would inevitably be quite misleading. It's important to consider green claims in the context of the product's overall impact. So at Food Steps, for example, we always measure the carbon footprint from farm to waste. So looking across the product's full life cycle. Uh, the Green Claims Code also recommends that you include a URL or QR code to guide consumers towards additional information that can help paint a fuller picture of your sustainability story, um, as obviously there's only so much that you can get across on a small label. And Rose will take you through some examples of this a bit later on. Uh, so then looking at the fourth principle of the Green Claims Code, Green claims uh, should only make fair and meaningful comparisons. So while it's obviously quite appealing to be able to assert your product as the market leader in sustainability, it can be pretty difficult to do so accurately. So the basis of your comparison has to be very clear. And it's important that you're comparing like for like, including using the same methods. So it would be much easier to compare your own products, for example, and nudge people towards the lower carbon option, as you can verify that these have been assessed in the same way. Um, and yeah, Rose will uh, will show some examples of that later on. Uh, the fifth principle would be to consider the full life cycle of a product, um, which I mentioned a bit earlier. Um, so while it's perfectly acceptable to refer to a specific aspect of your product and its supply chain, it's important that you're taking the full life cycle into account. So business should businesses should focus on aspects that are most significant in terms of overall impact to avoid misleading customers. Um, and also importantly, acknowledge where exclusions have been made. Uh, then finally, and very importantly, green claims should always be substantiated. So in order for environmental claims to be verified as truthful and accurate, uh, businesses must provide supporting evidence. So assessment providers like us uh, will always help ensure that the data used by our clients is robust and up to date, and also that our methodology is being made publicly accessible. Uh, I'm now going to pass back over to Rose to chat about what compliance could look like for you. All righty. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Sophie. Um, so now that we're familiar with the context of labels, we've seen some examples, we understand some kind of like regulatory background. Uh, we wanted to share some solid examples. Some of them are going to be made up ones uh, for the sheer purpose of an example. And some of them are actually going to be how our clients have used our carbon labels and how they've also used the data that we provide for them to help build their marketing claims. 
Oh, um, so the, with these hints in mind, we thought it might be useful to show an example of what um, could be considered a compliant claim. Uh, we do also have a whole separate webinar, which, you know, we're talking about lots of different resources that we've got today in this session. We will include all of this in the follow up notes. Um, uh, a whole webinar on uh, how to market your sustainable claims that goes into a lot more detail. So we highly recommend you watch this. Um, but for these particular examples, these are some uh, compliant claims that we've made up for you. So we're going to start on the left. We're going to break these down. Uh, so on the left hand side, we've got our coffee beans are certified low carbon by insert assessment provider and obviously we've put that there because it could be us it could be somebody else uh, but and they've also included a QR code that Sophie just mentioned and also a list uh, to a URL as well so they're being very specific um, about the product itself which makes it compliant they're not just saying coffee they're saying coffee beans um, which is really really important going back to some of the principles that Sophie just showed you uh, they're using sp specific language that their assessment provider has given to them. So if this was uh, an assessment made by us, for example, your customer would be able to go to that URL or that QR code and go to a landing page where they can learn about food steps methodology and how our rating system from very low to very high actually works. And then they would be able to understand the context of what that low carbon claim actually means. Um, and also by referencing your assessment provider, you're backing up your claims even more and and this is even bolstered with the QR code. So all these kind of like elements together make it basically almost bulletproof. Um, uh, and then we're going to show you an example on the right. So we offset 100% of product emissions through our Amazon reforestation project. We are also actively working to reduce our carbon footprint by 50%. And they've included a little URL once again. So Whilst uh, we are aware that offsetting is currently a bit of a contentious subject, we did still want to include this example because we also know that offsetting or insetting is a critical part of many companies' net zero journeys, and we would not want to vilify anybody. Um, and also as somebody who's worked in marketing, myself in sustainability for many years, I know that offsetting can be mentioned quite a lot. So here's an example of if you wanted to mention offsetting, a way that you could make sure that it is compliant and couldn't be perceived as a greenwash claim. So number one, what makes this code, uh, this particular claim compliant? It states how much they are offsetting. They're saying that they are doing 100%. What part of their emissions or their scope one, two, three are they uh, offsetting? Their product emissions, and they're saying how they are doing it. It's the Amazon reforestation project. And then they also assert uh, future reduction intentions. Uh, so they said that they're actively working towards reducing their footprint and they also give a number uh, of 50% um, instead of using something that could be a little bit more fluffy that we see quite a lot to be climate friendly by and then input a year here that might not actually be attached to any actual solid um, SPTI goal or net zero goal. Uh, so both of these examples are really, really um, kind of like solid cases for being specific. Um, make sure you're being clear about the science-based ways that you are measuring, backing up with a link or a QR code, and also using a data assessment provider. So as you can see here, just emphasis on the links, but we'll get to that in a second. So onto some topical context. Um, if you are interested in adopting sustainable claims, maybe you haven't done it before, uh, or maybe your brand is uh, looking to maybe 2024 and you're thinking about what particular campaigns can we do, what kind of products you're going to launch. We thought this particular news about uh, carbon neutral schemes and claims might be really, really handy for you to know. Uh, you might have seen this in the news already uh, that carbon neutral claims are gradually being phased out. So we know from this article from the grocer that major players in the food and beverage industry, such as Nestle and Leon, and uh, contract caterer Sodexo are among some of the companies that are slowly moving away or have entirely phased out uh, their carbon neutral claims. Um, another compelling reason for food companies to consider labeling is the declining trust among uh, consumers in carbon offsetting. Uh, so carbon neutral claims or other kind of uh, carbon offset adjacent uh, assertions might be something that you might look to maybe uh, move a bit away from. 
so the carbon trust, for instance, I mean, we all know the carbon trust, uh, they are ditching entirely their carbon neutral label and they're replacing it with four new consumer facing ones. Uh, and they focus on emissions reduction and uh, comparison of products. Uh, if you haven't seen this article in the grocer before, I think I said the caterer before, it's actually the grocer. Um, if you have seen this article, uh, yeah, give it another read because I think it's a really great um, kind of like stick in the ground for where this whole industry is moving towards. Uh, but the things that they're going to be facing on, like I said, is emissions reduction and also comparison of products like we've just seen in the um, uh, the principles that Sophie shared earlier. Comparison is probably going to be something that you should look into. Um, so let's move on to actually seeing how our labels can be used in action by our clients. So once again, uh, Carbon labels and environmental labels or environmental claims can be used at multiple touch points for your customers. Uh, so we're going to take you through some different examples of how they can be placed. Uh, so this example comes from Kew Gardens. So after we've conducted a platform based assessment for them, meaning that they measured part of their offering on our software and our platform, uh, we created a series of carbon labels for them that they applied to signage throughout their cafe at different points of sale. They've got posters and they've got table talkers as well. Uh, so Q really approached this in a way that we'd recommend, which is making it about the multiple touch points once again. Uh, so think about where your customer is going to be engaging and think about the um, mental capacity in which your uh, customers in terms of attention, how much attention can they give your carbon labels? Is it better to put it on a poster? Is it better to put it on a table talker? Um, but I do believe this example really illustrates that uh, you don't need to solely um, depend upon marketing or putting posters and uh, using labels that are only low or very low on that scale. You can still use high, very high, uh, to offer comparisons for your customers. Um, it's all about building carbon literacy and it's all about transparency as well. And also sharing your, uh, your higher rated items demonstrates that you don't want to vilify your customers for choosing higher ones. You're literally just offering them the information in the first instance. Um, and we think this really enables you to um, help your customers uh, strengthen their carbon literacy as they're going along their sustainable journey as you are as well. So let's talk about menus. So for those of you who are eating at Coco de Mama, uh, you'll know how it is. It's a very quick grab and go experience. It's beautiful, delicious food that you can get when you're having a bit of a mental day in the office. So Coco knew that they had to create, once again, multiple touch points that uh, were at different places throughout their stores to make sure that it fitted within the context of their diners. So Coco, they wanted to use like simplified labels, as you can see here, just on the left hand side. Um, just for the sheer sake of, you know, your customers are poor on time. They just want to get in. They want to look at what they usually have. And if they see a carbon label, they can go, oh, OK, that's interesting. I think I'll choose that one. Make it quick and easy for them. Um, it's also worth noting that this particular example uh, predates our recent update of our labels. So if somebody does wish to use a simplified label, obviously you can make it suit uh, your particular needs as a brand. But these are the two that we would recommend. As you can see, once again, it's showing the, the classification of where it sits on the rating. And it's also giving you a color indication. Wonderful. So we more from Coco de Mama. They really they knocked it out of the park. Um, so Coco de Mama wanted to build carbon literacy with their customers. They also wanted to maximize the amount of um, exposure that their customers had to their uh, labels. And also they wanted to sell lower rated items, which if you have net zero goals or you have particular climate goals, this could be a core um, goal that you're working towards. And this is a great example of how you can nudge your customers towards um, buyer lowering rated items. Um, so how did they do this? They placed carbon labels, like I said, alongside uh, the menu, but they also make sure it was accompanied in different touch points that had particularly uh, core parts of information. So as you can see here on this table talker, they are offering you two examples of little carbon swaps that you could have. They show you the rating, they show you what the menu, uh, what the item itself looks like, and they've even included information, if you can see it here on the screen, that. Uh, a bit of information that 60% of cocoa recipes are low, very low carbon. So they're offering a bit of more context as to the wider, like Sophie said, your brand reputation, what kind of um, what kind of steps are you taking in order to remove, uh, lower your carbon footprint? 
Um, and also with this table talk as well, they uh, add a bit of information once again about the assessment provider, which is us at this particular instance. Uh, and they state about um, particular things like uh, looking at the life cycle, the full life cycle analysis, um, and then they send you through to a QR code. So where does that QR code send you? So it sends you to a bespoke uh, landing page for that particular uh, meal. In this instance, it is Sassy Salmon. Um, and what are the core parts, you know, uh, that this landing page uh, encapsulates that I think really like, they knocked it out of the park with this one. They included all the bits that we would usually recommend. So they include the environmental labeling. They also talk about the carbon impact per dish. Uh, information about the data provider, you know, once again, backing up with these sciencey people did this for us. Uh, and they also revealed core information in the version of um, a pie chart about different, about the life cycle, basically, and all the different parts of it. Uh, and they also offered some small carbon swap suggestions, which is always nice. You always got to think about those different ways that you're using labels to nudge your customers towards lower carbon options if it suits them. And they also wanted to build carbon literacy. So also uh, including uh, a section on what does uh, kilograms of CO2E actually mean in the first place. Lovely. So the final um, example here. So, you know, we've showed you some examples of how the labels itself and the data can be used in tandem with each other. But what if you aren't quite ready to take that jump with labels? That's absolutely fine. We know that this webinar is about carbon labels, but we think we'd be amiss without um, offering you an example of what can be done with the data just by itself. Um, so this example comes from Ask Italian. Uh, they chose us to use the data, or they chose to use the data and the measurements behind the labels to build a sustainable swaps menu, uh, which helped customers who are looking to make climate conscious choices. Um, so we're all familiar, or those of us who have dined in restaurants before, we know that we're very familiar with uh, vegan menus or gluten-free menus or low calorie menus um, or particular allergen menus. What if your customers, you know, are in the mindset where they want to start making sustainable choices and you actually have this on offer, you overhear a conversation from a diner and you can offer this particular kind of menu. Um, we think that you know, meet your customers where they are at all the different touch points. Once again, if you have climate conscious uh, consumers, this is a great way to hand something to them that's solid and to go, our brand really cares about this and we've used data to help you make more sustainable choices. So we're getting towards the end of today's session, um, but we right at the end just wanted to state that we understand that not every food brand is going to have the luxury of changing their recipe mix or even have the possibility to lower the uh, impact of their highest uh, selling items. But we don't want you to see this as an obstacle for using carbon labels and measuring your footprint in the first place. So here are some of our thoughts on how you could own and really embody uh, your higher rated items or some kind of suggestions. So like I said, please don't see it as an obstacle. It's an opportunity to lead with radical transparency. At the end of the day, most consumers are moving towards um, being more climate focused. Even though we are in a cost of living crisis, this is a trend that is growing and growing. So the quicker that you get ahead of the curve could actually, once again, going back to what Sophie said, build that brand reputation. Uh, sharing labels with customers can be a starting point to, once again, communicate your climate intentions and also nudging your customers from even if it's uh, an E rated, which is very high to a D rated, which is a high item, is still a carbon win. If your customers are dining with you several times a week or several times a month, think about it as like compounded carbon interest. And if they are buying your higher rated items and they're nudging down to a low one and they consistently carry on that behavior, then that's a carbon win for you. And also, let's not forget about the internal factors. Finding carbon hotspots within your recipe if you want to measure. Let's remember, in order to get carbon labels in the first place, you have to measure your impact. Uh, finding your carbon hotspots within your recipe is a great starting point towards your net zero goals. So, getting to the end now. Uh, to slowly kind of like wrap it up, um, you might be wondering, why would you want to start understanding your carbon footprint in the first place? 
this in itself could be a whole separate webinar and we do love to talk to people about different ways that you could go about measuring your footprint and also like why you would want to do it in the first place um but to save you some time because we understand it is the morning we've written a six-part blog uh, or sophie has written a six-part blog that we're very proud of uh, that helps you identify the core business cases for tackling the climate crisis um and we know that when considering carbon measurement or labels Internally, there are multiple stakeholders, right? And that is gonna be a realistic barrier for many of us. Um, we address the business case in this particular um, blog. So we will we'll include it in the follow-up notes for you all. So uh, some of you might have noticed that we are talking a lot about going back to a source somewhere, QR codes and URLs. Um, you might not have that at your disposal. You might not even have the capacity within your own team to actually create those kind of things. You know, you're probably very busy people. You can't be dilly dallying making landing pages. So we have created something new for you, which hopefully we think you'll enjoy. <laughs> We'd like to introduce to you Food Story. Um, so Food Story is a new offering that we have literally just launched. Um, it's an online mobile first landing page experience with multiple different tabs. Um, and it helps you, the food brand, communicate all the information that you need to in order to be Green Claims Co compliant, educate your customers, really own your low carbon and high carbon dishes and share more information about them. And it also talks about your collaboration with Food Steps. So if you use us as an assessment provider, um, you might not be able to see here, but there's a whole tab on methodology, which really is going to help bolster and bulletproof your claims against um, any kind of fines. So that is absolutely everything for today. I think we'll get started into the questions. Um, I see that we do have one already. Wonderful. Um, and I think let's see if there's any questions in the chat. No, it doesn't seem to be. OK, here we go. Great question. What is your view on carbon labels versus more holistic environmental labels that include more impact category, e.g. water and biodiversity? Due to the accounting methodology, some carbon footprints may increase, even though they are se they are sequestration benefits or biodiversity advantages of some crops. Ooh, this is a very good question. I know that several people from the Food Steps team are on the call right now, so feel free. I mean, this is, I'm a marketing person. This is definitely not my purview. Um, Sophie, do you feel like you could tackle I, that? I'm going to, I think I'm actually going to jump in on this one, Rose. Um, ah, sorry, so, I had my, I had my No mic. problem at all. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Harriet. I'm, I'm head of customer success at Food Steps. Um, and I think this is a really fantastic question. I guess, um, our approach at Food Steps has been to start with carbon because it's where there is the most reliable data. Um, so that's where we're starting at the moment. Um, but I think it's absolutely important to be thinking beyond that. I think we're all doing that. And I think water use and biodiversity are the ones that are at the top of the list. But everyone in the industry right now, we know how important it is. So I suppose this is something that's absolutely in our future um but it comes down to the quality of the information that's out there um we want to be making sure that we're using kind of robust information every step of the way and that the methodology is something that we can really confidently lean on so i guess a bit of a watch this space um we're also a very um proud supplier with um Foundation Earth, who are also doing great stuff here, working to the PEF methodology, which takes 16 indicators into account. Um, so yeah, really good question. Thanks so much. Amazing. Um, Liam, do you have any inclination as to when the EU directive may come into effect? Sophie, did you cover this in the blog? <laughs> Um, so we don't personally have any inclination um, about when it might come into effect. I guess also important to think about the fact that different EU member states will be developing their own environmental labelling schemes and those will take time um, to be developed um, and agreed on. Uh, so yeah, sorry, not, not too much indication. Um, it's upcoming and I think it's definitely one to, to kind of keep tabs on and we will we'll be doing that as well. Wonderful. Um, okay, we've got another one. I'm in edutainment. Oh, love that word. Uh, say corporate training and development dedicated to sustainable nutrition. We share DIY recipes for our platform users. How can we access and leverage food steps? Oh, this is a really wonderful question. Harriet, I don't know if you want to jump in, um, but we uh, we offer, we help 
customers of all different shapes and sizes. I'm sure Harriet will share yeah. a bit on that. Um, thanks so much for your question, Amit. I would say um, get in touch with us. Um, this sounds like a really exciting opportunity. Um, so I guess a bit more about Food Steps as a platform. It's really designed for all kinds of people in different roles to use. Um, and it works on a subscription basis, depending as well on like how much information you have and what you want to use it for, we can kind of find the right fit. Um, but yeah, that sounds really exciting. We'd love to chat more about that. Okay, okay. yes, and our contact information is just here if you do wish to use it. Um, okay, I think we've got Yes, we've got we've got time. Uh, does Food Steps and consider collaborations and partnerships with SMEs and startups that are able to extend your presence in the food industry? Oh, very budget restricted. Oh, okay, this is a wonderful question. Um, Joey, I will get in touch with you because the answer is we'd love to explore different opportunities. Uh, we also know, like I said in the beginning of this presentation, uh, there's a huge amount of carbon, a huge amount of environmental impact of greenhouse gases, 26% of global emissions that we have to tackle um, as, a, as a group. So, uh, you know, collaborations are always, always welcome. And I shall be in touch with you. Lovely. Um, Wonderful. So we've got a few extra minutes. Um, if anybody Rose, does, wish... sorry, Rose. I think there are a couple in the chat as well. Um, I oh, can... fantastic! One about the Defra methodology, um, and how it's going to impact the food steps label. Um, I think you know right now what they're actually developing is like the methodology behind that, rather than um actually what the label is going to look like so I think it's much more around making sure that everyone is working from the same starting place so that we can all build trust with consumers because there is so much greenwash out there so I suppose the way it's going to impact the label is not necessarily the design itself because I don't think we're looking for that to be or we're not expecting there to be like really clear directives on the appearance but more about like all of the information that's backing it up um so I guess we're trying to just stay ahead of the curve as much as possible um, and stay in active conversations with the team at DEFRA. Um, so the only way it's going to change is making sure that we're compliant. Um, we're hoping we're doing that all of the right things anyway, and we're all about kind of being as thorough as possible um, and using the best data available. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess we'll watch this space, but we're, tr we're trying to keep as abreast to those plans as we possibly can. Um, and I guess that actually links into a little bit more um, on Rachel's question as well about the FDDP. Um, so as I say, I, I, we're not expecting a mandatory label right now or so much a man, like sort of mandatory labeling more along the lines of mandatory methodology. And we just think that's really important. We, we want it. Um, we think it's really, really important. So I suppose we think all of those people who want to lead the way um, and want to use labels, it, like we're, we're very keen to do that. We also think that to kind of to Rose's point, starting with measurement is the most important thing if we're going to support everyone to reach that zero. Um, communicating with diners, consumers um, is really, really important. It doesn't need to be in a label format if the businesses aren't there yet. Um, I guess, yeah, it will continue to evolve. Um, but what's really important is starting to understand your baseline and making plans. Um, so looking at your supply chain, looking at maybe menu reformulation or product reformulation to make uh, you know the reduction wherever it's possible. Um, is there any data on different labels being confusing for consumers? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I suppose um, Sophie ran through some of the research that we did um, to try and understand what works best. And working with Paul Lohman, who has done extensive research on this, and actually our founder, Anya Doherty, um, this all kind of started off the back of her research at the University of Cambridge, working with the University university catering service so I guess we want to stay as close to the research as we can um but yeah I think this is kind of why any guidance coming from DEFRA we will jump on it because yeah we want to avoid confusion just make it as clear as possible um we also think that just like kind of slapping a label on and walking away isn't going to be effective it needs to be part of a more coherent strategy 
um, which is why we recommend kind of marketing materials and we talk to teams about how they go out and speak to their consumers using things like food story posters and all of those things because it's new right um, but I guess all of these things were new at some point like health labeling and we just want to get this into people's psyches um, so we can start talking to it we're also very open to feedback so um, yeah please do use that contact email address for feedback as well as questions um, because we'd really love to hear your thoughts wonderful let's just see if there are any more questions before we hop off wonderful okay thank you so much Sophie and Harriet for catching all those questions um hopefully everyone is stepping away with a thorough knowledge of what the future might look like for them when it comes to methodology carbon labeling uh or what measuring looks like for you in the future I think that's all for today thank you so much for uh attending and we look forward to speaking with you in the future all right take care everyone